Tracy Brown, my friend, Huna student, NLP trainer, body language expert, lie detecting, badass friend of mine, Tracy Brown. How you doing? Awesome. I'm psyched to be here. <laughs> it's great to have you. Um, I tell you, you and I have had some adventures, many oh, yeah. adventures in this in this world. We've been friends for a long time. Yeah. Um, you were my first trainer in neuro linguistic programming. I got a certification from you. Mm -hmm. I've obviously read your book. You know, we've done some cool stuff together. We even went to the Big Island of Hawaii and studied La Alcahea together, yeah. which mm -hmm. is uh, one of the great, many, many great memories in my life. And you even introduced me to uh, Big John, who lent me his bus for uh, any time I wanted it. And I lived in that VW bus, as you did whenever you went on island. Um, so aloha, my friend. Aloha. <laughs> I love you, the bus. Also... I love the bus still. <laughs> I wish I had I wish I had it on my computer to show everybody, but that's it's on my fridge, the green beast um that that guzzled not only fuel, but it guzzled oil. oil. Mm -hmm. And then you have to stick your hand in there every other time you'd burn the crap out of your hand when you're putting oil in it. Have a little screaming fit at the uh, gas station and then mm -hmm. back to living the dream back to living on the um, beach yeah it was a good time 1979 lime green volkswagen bus with a pop top yeah that thing was awesome it was all right well now things have changed right you and i so i was a it was a long-haired hippie when we were going to uh when i was training with you in nlp and training with you on, on the big island mm -hmm. and you know decades later um you know, we've we've had many adventures and many shifts in our careers. Mm -hmm. You're now a, a pretty well-known, kind of world-renowned body language expert. I'm and kind I've... of a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> you are. I knew you would be. Um, and I, somehow, I find I found myself in finance and uh, and private equity. Yeah, you, and, you uh, you've come a long way from. Hey, I'm going to make a million dollars teaching saxophone lessons. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Well, I was right on the million, you know, I was, I was aiming at that million dollars. The saxophone and flute didn't get me there. I had to get into finance and, and private equity. Such a um, shame. Such a shame. So, but, but that being said, you know, um, that I've been ripped off, mm -hmm. you know, that my mom's been ripped mm -hmm. off, you know, many, many people that have been ripped mm -hmm. off. And um, I've talked to you speci about specific deals and about specific techniques. Um, and I know you get these questions all the time, but let's let's tear into it. I'm a finance guy. Uh, somebody brings me a deal. Some guy I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, he starts pitching me an amazing deal. The math looks good. What am I looking for when I start vetting the dude, right? The presenter. Yeah. This, we call it the sponsor, the general partner of these deals. Mm -hmm. What do I start looking for? Well, it, when you talk to people who do investments, they do the first thing they do is rip off any page with words on it and just go to the uh, Excel spreadsheet part at the back. Like uh, like any legitimate guy that I know, I suppose girls, but uh, guys that I know do that. Now, the um, next thing that you're doing all the time is you are evaluating who is putting this deal in front of you. And you may not even consciously know that you're doing it, but there's something inside of you. And we'll get into the science of this a little bit later, but there's something inside of you that's always sizing people up. And especially when they're wanting you to put your money on the line, you're making a judgment as to if this person is legit or not. And I know from your experiences you're also, you have learned to ask some other questions about the other people that may be in the room around uh, who are also, quote, investors or potential investors. And what's going on is, is you're, it goes on for all of us all the time. We are constantly making judgments about who's around us. And we don't often know what that information adds up to specifically, but we get a feeling. We get a feeling about it like something's not right or something just feels 
perfect here. And so my job is to train people who are super analytical because you're, you're kind of different than the average investment guy. Cause you have a, uh, like the feelings and, and you're like, and you're tuned into that. A lot of those investment guys are not, it's just dollars and cents to them. And to the extent that you make any deal, just dollars and cents and take the feeling out of it, you are bound to lose money at some point because it's, it's, it's my job to make sure that you don't rationalize away things and information and feelings that are right in front of you, right inside you that um, can lead to big losses. That's right. I mean, the, the, there is a saying I'll, I'll stumble my way through it, but something to the effect of uh, you know, spreadsheets are the, the best way to lie to somebody, right? Oh, yeah. You look at spreadsheets and you go, wow, this, this, this makes sense. Here's where it works. And then for someone like me, let's take a real estate deal, for example, I can go through a spreadsheet and I can see the BS numbers in half a second. Mm -hmm. But if it's, uh, let's just say the BS, let's say the numbers, the specific numbers are not quite BS. They're just a little elevated or just a little reduced or, you know, maybe there's a rounding error. Um, that doesn't mean that that sponsor is able to execute on those. It just means that those are in the normal parameters that I would expect to be in that spreadsheet mm -hmm. for those, you know, for a vacancy rate, for example, mm -hmm. or an interest rate on a loan, you know, or a CapEx or, 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 right. Mm -hmm. um, and we can, me included, and, and I've been ripped off. I've had to sue somebody. Uh, my family's been ripped off. So I am, my guards up. Yeah. And I can still get blind. I, I am still blinded by optimism. Yeah. Right? I'm still blinded by greed. Greed is a uh, greed is like an opaque blanket you can throw over many people's heads. Uh huh. <laughs> so, t I mean, let, tell me about that. So, I, I get stoked on a deal, right? Mm -hmm. And I start counting up all the dollars I'm gonna make. Right. Um. And I start and I start ignoring what. Mm -hmm. Well, here's what you start ignoring is, um, well, let me tell you why you start ignoring. You may ignore everything. You may ignore everything. As, as much as we think we're logical and rational and reasonable, we are not. We are, that, that is a very, very small part of our brain. The part of us that makes decisions is your unconscious mind, and it's based on feeling. Now, it's also based, it also has a flaw, and the flaw is unconscious bias. And right. uh, I would say greed could be categorized into one of those, um, let's call them slots of bias, such that it will cloud your judgment. And that's what, and, and that, that's why we have each other, right? So we can bounce things off each other and be like, Hey, you know, what do you think of this? What am I not seeing here? And uh, because there, there's, there's all different kinds of bias. There's like, I don't know, 20 different kinds of of bias uh, that basically can get in there and cloud your judgment in, in any situation, any situation, it could be romance. It could be friendship. It could be um, uh, anything at all, right? Anything at all, any decision that, that you may need to make, you can mess yourself up because of what's going on deeply unconsciously. So let's test it out. You want to test it out? This is what I do in my keynotes. Cause a lot of what I do is speak to banking and insurance groups. So, when I say Tom Brady, what's the first uh, word that comes into your mind? Quick, quick, quick. First Super word. Bowl. Super Bowl. Okay. What's the next one? About him personally. Tall. Tall. Handsome. Handsome. Okay. Hot so girlfriend. Okay. So you think he's good looking. All right. Now, that's great. So people love people that are good looking. They just do. So if Tom Brady came to you with a deal, you'd probably be like, oh, that sounds great. But guess what? Um, and, and everybody else does that too. A lot, Not everybody. A lot of people do. And uh, so what did FTX do, knowing that? <laughs> they signed him up to promote FTX, which is one of the biggest frauds of all times. I don't know. I don't know how many millions or billions of dollars that that fellow Sam Bankman Freed used inappropriately because people think Tom Brady is hot. OK, now and <laughs> it's true. Right now, a lot of um, a lot of my. Uh, people in my, in my talk, they'll come up with liar or cheat or goat, right? All, all of those, all of those. And all of those are true. Okay. Now that's going to cloud your judgment on what you see from them. 
right? And so uh, what, I'll, what I'll do in my talks is I'm like, great, write it down. Do not think, just write it down. And then we'll go into his deflate gate press conference where we're talking about the body language and deception and what goes on. And I'm like, look, you got, all you got to do is understand your bias and to the best of your ability, set that aside so that you can see clearly. Like if you understand what your bias is, you're going to be miles and miles ahead of any kind of analysis because um, you understand what like it's like it's like the Wizard of Oz, right? The man behind the curtain pulling the pulling the levers. It's deeply unconscious. It's going to affect you. So, um, I don't know how we got on bias, but that's why you screw up. Well, yeah, it, it's. I was going to ask, and you kind of beat me to it. How much is it know thyself versus you know a sophisticated scammer? And a lot. What you're saying is a lot of it is know thyself. Yeah. Know where your blind spots spots are, and then look at them. You know. So mm -hmm. one of my so I just acknowledge one of my biases, right? I, uh, I, I can be overly optimistic and I can mm -hmm. be uh, greedy on a deal and see all the upside, right? Mm -hmm. or, or, and somebody might be the exact opposite. They, they might just see all the downside and all the risk. And those are the type of people that never invest in anything. Oh yeah. Right? That, that's how my husband is. We're total opposites that way. Total opposites. Like I'll, I'll, I'll double down, bet on myself. And he's, and he, it, it, with business stuff, you know, and I just did that with my big uh, video premiere. Uh, the, but he's like, no way, give me a job that's solid. Right. Well, we yeah. all know that jobs aren't that solid and, uh, and, you know, knock on wood, he could be laid off anytime. Right. And with me, I'm like, I'm betting on myself and that, you know, it takes a lot to get to that spot. However, they're, they're different. They're, one is optimistic and one is uh, like a bias towards um, uh, risk aversion. Right. Yeah. So um, it, there's no one better than the other, but it is about knowing yourself. And here's the thing is that most people don't take the time to know themselves because it's not all often a comfortable uh, look right? To, to understand what's really going on for you and how you really make decisions. But also like, like one of mine is I like to do things fast. I'm like, let's go, let's go right now. And that is my number one thing to, that I need to make sure that I'm watching out for, because I will make a decision too fast because uh, why wait, you know, <laughs> and, and, and it screws me up every time I, I, I just go with the decision. It, 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 it screws up. Um, so patience, waiting, it's something I had to force myself into. You know, I'm very similar. So my friend joked to me the other day that I'm the guy who jumps in the water without testing the temperature. <laughs> um, right? Or I'm the guy who jumps out of the plane and then figures out how to, how to create a parachute. Uh -huh. um, and that can work, right? Because you can beat people to the punch, uh -huh. whatever the punch is, the deal or the adventure, whatever it is. But it also, it comes with a lot of pain, right? Mm -hmm. It comes with a lot of wasted, or I shouldn't say wasted. It comes with a lot of energy that might might be directed in in in, in a direction that is suboptimal for you. Um, well, it's that. You know, I put, also, yeah, it can subvert the law of attraction when, you, when you're in a hurry, because uh, I, I think it's very real. Uh, and uh, anyway, so there, there's, there's a lot of things. Now, some people may never make a decision. They may wait and wait and wait. That's how my husband does. Drives me bananas, bananas. Because like we could, we, I'm not saying a rush, but we could easily cut the decision time in half, like on a new car or uh, whatever, the, whatever the case may be. Right. So there's pros and cons. Well, I'll give a perfect example from an investment standpoint or an entrepreneurial standpoint. I, do you remember my biodiesel days? I do. I remember, remember that van too. Yeah. The, yeah. the one of your neighbors kept calling the cops. <laughs> <laughs> so real quick for those, you know, real quick for people listening, I got a shuttle bus, you know, that you'd have, you'd, you'd have at a, a ski resort, converted it to run on straight vegetable oil. So it was an, you know, S SVO rig, biodiesel mm -hmm. rig. And, um, and I thought I was going to save the world with biodiesel and everybody should know that they can run their, diesel trucks off, off vegetable oil. And I'm going to show you how it's done. And, uh, and so I built a touring bus. Mm -hmm. I took bands all around the country and I played in their bands and they paid me for my bus and I filled it up with vegetable oil. And, 
uh, there's a lot of adventures and dramas and, and challenges with just putzing around the, the country on vegetable oil. And I thought I was, you know, I was young and I'm like, I'm going to show them how it's done. These big oil companies, I'm going to show them what's what. <laughs> and then two years later, three years later, as I, you know, years into the this, after being covered with used vegetable oil because of malfunctions and after all this stuff, I then decided to do the calculation of how, you know, what, what's the most efficient uh, crop that yields the most oil, you uh -huh. know, vegetable oil to, to, to burn. And, um, and then how capable is the earth of, of, you know, sustaining that, uh -huh. like how viable is biodiesel for realsies, uh -huh. right? Yeah. And so I did a little math you know, that I should have done, I don't know, before I did all this. And I forget exactly what the calculation was, but it was essentially something like this. If we took every piece of land on planet Earth uh -huh. and and grew canola oil on it, it would power the planet for, for three days, something like that. I mean, oh, it really? was it was essentially impossible. Uh -huh. there, there, it was not going to power the earth. It was not going to sustain our energy needs. It wasn't going to do squat. Now it might take, uh, it, it might have taken me and my bandmates around the country a few times uh -huh. and uh, it lowered the price of our fuel costs. But um, as a viable business, it had, it wasn't viable. Mm -hmm. it, and so had I known my bias back then of, rushing into things, jumping in the water without testing the temperature. Um, had I known that, maybe I would have hedged, done a little math at the beginning, and then not have proceeded um, so ignorantly and arrogantly. Whatever we'll happened to that bus? So I sold everything to, I sold that bus to a, uh, to a, to a band. I sold all the equipment. You know, I built a whole process. Yeah, you had refining. Facility. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. And so I sold that to bits and pieces to other people who were running biodiesel rigs and I got out of it. You know, I broke even, but yeah, I sold it. And the only, the only time that works is for music. <laughs> it's for bands to go get free fuel on the road free, right? Uh -huh. It's a lot of work sucking used vegetable oils out of, you know, out of the back alleys of, of Chinese. Yeah. Out of the grease trap at, at uh, China Panda or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> That's exactly right. So <laughs> now I'm, I'm a little longer in the tooth. I got a few gray hairs. Um, I am, I've taken a more pragmatic approach. I've taken a do your own math approach. Mm -hmm. um, and I still am biased towards greed and hustle and, and let's charge forward. Mm -hmm. But what I do is I partner with people that are more like your husband, that are more pragmatic, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a little more conservative, a little more down to earth. Um, now you don't need them to drag you down so much that you can't do a deal, but uh, having those checks and balances on your team, you know, it's why people have underwriters at ba mm -hmm. banks, you know, it, you it have helps to have Dr. No on the team. It really does. <laughs> Dr. No. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> on the team. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, and, and, and even that, right. Even I've seen some very, very smart people. Um, still get ripped off, mm -hmm. right? And these are people that have some degree of of self knowledge and know their biases, mm -hmm. and are still there's sophisticated mm -hmm. scammers out there, especially in real estate and, and finance. And you know, when you're moving large sums of money, um, it attracts people who want it. And oh yeah, like people, and bad people. Like what about that group who tried to uh, foreclose on Graceland the other day? I haven't heard about you that. Haven't heard about it. Oh yeah. So it was a scam group out of uh, one of the Asian countries, I believe, who uh, came up with this company and they said, we loaned, uh, I don't know who's left in the Presleys, but whoever's managing Graceland, we loaned her $3 million. She hasn't paid us and we're going to foreclose on Graceland. And she's like, no, 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 I never did any of this, but the documents were so legit looking that it caught a lot of attention. And, um, Anyway, they finally got sniffed out. Uh, it didn't take too long, but can you imagine the stress of losing Graceland? Like, oh my goodness. That is, bon you know, that is bonkers. Mm -hmm. They must, so that's a perfect example. Those people must be very, very sophisticated because what are you forging? You're forging a note, a deed of yeah. trust, mm -hmm. you know, a, a chain of title, um, signatures, 
mm-hmm. notarized documents. I mean, that's a, that's a heavy duty. Um, that's a heavy forged document load that you must mm-hmm. create to even try to pull that off. Um, you know, for me, I'm like, how could anybody ever do that? But then you hear these stories and you're like, wow, they got pretty far down the road. I mean, I don't know this one in particular, but yeah, look it up. They did. Uh, they got really far down the road, like wow. enough, like really far to where it's like, oh, wait, Graceland might be gone. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Well, there, there's stories, you know, the, the, these these famous folks, you know, the the Tom Brady's and the John Elway's of the world. Mm-hmm. They're not surrounded by dumb dumbs. Right. They're they're generally surrounded by fairly smart people. They might be surrounded by a bunch of yes men, um, mm-hmm. but they also have sophisticated people around them doing deals and advising them and well let's you know. let's talk about john elway for a minute since we're on the topic okay. because uh he and i believe some of your friends got scammed by a uh financial advisor something like that and me and you looked up this financial advisor and i actually um wrote him a letter in prison i found out how to write letters to people in prison there's this internal email system for for prison and it costs you like two dollars an email or something like that so I get a hold of him because, because, you know, we're, we're, uh, you know, we're inching our way towards writing a book <laughs> or yeah. finishing, finishing the book, I should say. Yeah. And, we've been writing um, it. Yeah. 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 We have. Anyway. So I figure out this whole thing takes me half a day and I write, and I'm like, I got to butter this guy up. Right. Cause I want to talk to him. I want to find out how did he get all these super sophisticated people to give him money and then disappear. Right. So I wrote this note. I was like, look, I get you did some bad things and I get that you're in prison and I get that a lot of things. But I also get that you're really, really good at what you did. And I want to know how you did it. <laughs> and, um, never heard back. <laughs> yeah, I would try. I'd send him a letter once a year. You know, you I don't know how I don't know how long he's he's sentenced for. I'm sure it's many, many years. He's got a while. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, that's one of the many things I like about you you is you just go for it, right? Talk about your biases. Hey, I'm going to talk to this guy. He's in prison. Well, how do I find it? How do I talk to a guy in prison? Yeah. Half a day later, you're like, oh, I found the process to interview a guy in prison, right? Let's yeah. go for it. Yeah. Um, so, I, you know, you pointed out, so we learned something about Ponzi schemes when we started writing our book. Mm-hmm. And, and the thing that blew me away is most Ponzi schemes don't start as Ponzi schemes. Most, right. yeah, they, they start as well-intentioned investment Mm -hmm. deals and then the guy can't pay his investors and he believes in it wrong Mm -hmm. yeah he believes in it so he oh but i can take this investor's money and pay these other investors and it you know i'll I'll recoup it i'll make that money back um can you tell me this tell me the uh, story about that i mean tell me what you know about ponzi schemes and how they grow out of control and, and they don't originally start as a massive scam. Well, basically, here's what we got to know. And we learned this in the pandemic. It's the same thing. When people get stressed, they're going to do things that they would never normally hold themselves to do. Right. It doesn't matter if it's stealing toilet paper from work or stealing thousands and thousands and millions of dollars from folks. And so, yeah, a few of them do start out the, the wrong way, but a lot of them, are over prom- they they're over promised they know they're very well respected bernie madoff started his because he wanted approval from his father-in-law and what happens in these ponzi schemes is that they're very um socially driven right for certain groups hmm. so um maybe like, like bernie madoff targeted a lot of jewish folks right because you know they're like oh he's a jew he's got to be like he, he's like me. Like, and that goes back to what's deeply unconscious with bias is that people love people like them. People trust people that they perceive to be like them, right? So they call them like affinity groups is what they call them. Yeah. They, they can be social. They can be cultural. They can be um, it, it, anything that you think. It could be a group full of bike racers, a group full of musicians, a, Like, it, but people talk, right? And they start to trust each other. And, um, and what happens is they don't get the returns and there's a lot of shame that, uh, causes certain behavior. And, and, and they say some, some of my peers who are, 
uh, like military interrogators, FBI interrogators, they say you can tell everything you need to know about a person with what they do with shame and, and how they mm. handle their own shame. And um, I'm still digging more into that as, as time goes, <laughs> right? But I think a lot of these end up as like self-protection, right? And that's what they do with shame. It's what they do with things gone wrong. Interesting. Okay. Well, let's dig a little deeper there. So say I want, say I'm, I'm doing a deal with Joe Bob, right? Okay. And I've known Joe Bob for a little bit. Mm -hmm. How would I, how would I learn what he does with shame? How would I learn how he reacts and processes it? How would I, how would I learn this about somebody before stroking a check? Well, I think the, the number one thing that you gotta have is the real conversation before, like what happens when something goes wrong? And if they can't answer you in a way that's congruent, where everything is as it should be with their body language, um, which is a little bit interesting to look for, right? And it takes it takes a um, it takes some study in 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 raising your own sensory acuity, because uh, what happens is we pay so much attention to ourselves, right? We're considered with our own greed or maybe our own victory. Uh, our own uh, need to rush, right? As we've talked about, uh, all of that can can cloud cloud your 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 view such that you won't see subtle signs of deceit that are faint and go away very quickly, right? So, for instance, for instance, and th and this isn't necessarily a Ponzi scheme example, but let's just take this example. Um, a friend of mine who lives over here uh, in Denver, Park Hill area. Her husband and her uh, d would divide up the bills, right? And just like most couples do, I think. Like, okay, you pay the mortgage, I'm paying the insurance. That's some of how me and Matt do that. It's a real common thing, right? So every month she'd be like, hey, did you pay the insurance? And he would always drop something or turn away or spill something and, and say, yeah, you know, absolutely. Everything's fine, right? But it was every time, right, to divert her attention, right? To, to put up a redirect to, um, you know, he, maybe he cover his mouth, right? Or suddenly, you know, start coughing, like any of those kind of signs, but it was over and over and over again. And she never knew until they went to go get a divorce. And she found out there are 435,000 in debt. And she did not know it. Her kids college funds were cleaned out and she did not know it because this is what he was doing. And looking back, because hindsight's twenty twenty right? Looking back, the signs were all there. So the key is to not, is to realize people's patterns and when they deviate from normal behavior, right? It's called, it's called a, a baseline. Like you always want to be baseline in people to understand how they normally behave. And then what happens is when we get into a, a situation where deception may be present or at least a great amount of stress, uh, it, it can cause what's called cognitive load, right? Which basically means our prefrontal cortex, which is our thinking brain, is trying to take over our body function, which is much more uh, handled by the mammalian brain, right? Which is, that, that's where we have the nice flow, right? Okay. And so if our thinking brain takes over what should be deeply unconscious, you get hitches in the system, right? And, and you get things that feel out of order. You get word errors, uh, word error rate is a very high indicator of deception. When people choke on a certain word, listen to what that word was. It, do not rationalize it away. Do not rationalize it away. Do not re rationalize behavior away because that that's your cue. That's your cue. And if you dismiss it like, oh, you just, you know, people have to cough. Well, do they have to cough in the middle of the word investment or return? <laughs> really? Like, pay attention. It's the small stuff. Wow. It can make all the difference. Wow. That's, that's amazing. Um, so I, I've thought this for many, many years when you're judging someone, uh, whether you're going to get in business with them, whether you're going to marry them, whether you're going to yeah. date them, whether you're going to be friends with them. I mean, if I'm going to have a long, deep, real relationship with somebody, um, I don't, I, I want to know how they handle pain, mm -hmm. stress, Disappointment, you know the old Mike Tyson. Everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the face. It's true. Well, everybody's going to get punched in the face. That's life. Mm -hmm. And some people, it absolutely wrecks them. Mm -hmm. and, and I have walked away from companies, from deals, when I've seen the leader of that deal, whether it's a general partner, the leader of a company, or a friend, mm -hmm. or whatever, when they, you know, have a bump in the road and they lose it. 
Mm -hmm. Right. And I say, if they're going to get that upset about this little bump in the road, mm -hmm. what's going to happen when a real bump in the road where a real challenge hits them, is their head going to explode? Yeah. So, you nope know, I, I, I will lose a lot of faith in somebody if I see them freak out over, you know, spilled milk or spilled coffee or, you know, the, the waitress, you know, brings their, their tacos slow or messes up mm -hmm. the order, something little. And, 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 I would like to get better at, at leaving those situations and, and knowing that quicker. But mm -hmm. when I look back on it, I'm always grateful that I walked away from somebody who didn't have the strength, the calmness, the wisdom to realize that, you know, there's a million bumps in the road and I'm not going to freak out over this. Well, one. So and, and I've what, actually, what, you're, yeah, what you're alluding to is, is what we learned in NLP. The way someone does anything is the way they do everything. Right. And we all have certain patterns that will will unless unless we actually take the time to like we've been talking about, figure out what our patterns are and figure out the roots of them and let some stuff go that doesn't serve us anymore. Uh, you're going to keep doing those patterns over and yep. over and over again. Now, everybody has a certain uh, corner. I call it a corner that they go to when they get stressed. Right. Anger, sadness, fear or guilt. There's just there's really four of them. And um, they, they come around in different, they, they, they show themselves in a little bit different ways, but they'll show themselves in big ways, the bigger the problem gets, right? And so you got to understand it going into any relationship at all, any relationship, if, if you want to deal with that, right? Like, like for me, I'll tell you me, my, mine is, is fear. I go to fear. That's where I go. I don't like it. I hate it when it happens, but it happens, right? Right. And um, some people around go to anger, Right. I don't like those people. Yeah. I, I, I'm like steer clear. And, and I think you've mitigated yours quite a bit. Um, yeah. yeah. But people who, who go like it, I, it puts then, then I'm triggered. Right. So not only are they angered, they angry, but I'm scared. Right. And, and so it doesn't work that good. <laughs> right. Well, you know, it's amazing that you say that is because when I first came to you mm -hmm. as a, as a client, uh, as an NLP client. And we started, we did train your brain. We did, you know, I got a certification mm -hmm. from you. I was really good at anger. I was good at it. Mm -hmm. Right. And when we worked on our stuff, right. Yeah. Our unresolved negative emotions, I was, I've been able to take that anger to transmute or transform that anger into fuel to get stuff done, mm -hmm. not in yelling at somebody, not in hurting myself, just, I've been able to direct it, um, so here's a perfect example. I was studying for the series 65 and, uh, and I did all the practice tests. And then I found this whole new bunch of practice tests that were more like the real tests that I didn't know about uh -huh. um, until the day before the test. Uh -huh. Right. And instead of hoot and holler and yell and scream, and I just, I was mad. And what did, what did I do? I just put my head down and I cranked through all the tests, uh -huh. all the new tests that I found. Um, so, and, and it's funny that you bring that up because I think you helped me shift that in me to make that far more productive, to make that mojo, that life force, that whatever you want to call mm -hmm. it, far more productive. And I know I'm, I'm going off on a tangent here on NLP, but let's bring it. So this is an NLP technique, right? Mm -hmm. that, yeah. that you showed me and you mm -hmm. can model this. There's a lot of ways you can implement this. Um, come full circle with the NLP and the lie detection. When you are listening to people the way you just suggested, right? Mm -hmm. You are finding their baseline. You're seeing mm -hmm. if they're getting off from their baseline. When mm -hmm. you listen to people like that, you're actually listening. You actually make good, um, you, you're a good conversationist, sensationalist mm -hmm. because you're not just sitting there waiting for your turn to speak. You're listening, right. you're analyzing and people appreciate that. Well, that's just like NLP when you're listening to those uh, verbal cues. Are mm -hmm. they kinesthetic learners? Are they visual? Are they auditory? Mm -hmm. If you're actually listening to those word cues, then you're actually listening. So not only does this make you a good lie detector, it makes you a good read of character. It also makes you a good listener and people will like you more because you're actually listening to what they have to say. And, right? and they will open up to you and they will tell you things they've never told anyone ever yeah. because they feel listened to. And that happens on my podcast all the time. I can... Name at least, uh, um, uh, you know, probably 10 people after we've got off the podcast, 
I've never told anyone that before. And here they just told it in this most public forum that they've never told anyone before. I had someone, <laughs> I'm not going to say who it is, uh, for, and you'll find out why. <laughs> so she's on my podcast. And then we, uh, we, you know, we're done and it's episode 131. It's, it's called truth, lies, and cover-ups. You can go listen. And it's a she great goes, podcast. Yeah, it's, it's fun. And I need to get back starting some more interviews, but she goes, well, you know, I didn't, I didn't tell you everything. And I'm like, okay, well, should I press record again? She's like, well, maybe not. And she goes, I have a Picasso in my basement. <laughs> and I'm like, what? Oh. <laughs> yeah. And, and she's, uh, she's, you know, try, try like she's like, what should I do? And I'm like, hell if I know what to do. I but like she told me that, right? <laughs> she she told me that. So um, you know, it's it's like when when you can stand in a place of non-judgment and and listen, like because yeah, yes, is there right and wrong? We're judging all the time. But if if you can like make someone feel listened to and like huh, and, and you can go, huh that's interesting behavior. I wonder how that behavior got created instead of, oh, you're wrong. Right. And, and that's, and that's what I hate about, <clears throat> about canceling people now. We're like, oh, everything about them is awful. Well, no, it's not like it, it's really like they did. They have maybe a couple beliefs or a couple behaviors that really are not uh, savory. Okay. Is everything about them horrible? No, that's, that, that's a convenient and very, a three-year-old belief, like, 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 like a three-year-old would have that you could actually, it's lazy. Yeah. It's lazy thinking. It's lazy. If you say, it's Oh, completely not self-aware. Yeah. And, um, you know, maybe it, maybe you don't want to listen to them. Maybe you don't want to be around them, but there's not everything about them as horrible. Like it's just not, it's impossible. Well, well, that's right. And, and find me, a, find me an unflawed human being. Right. And, and totally. that's an attitude that I, that I hear from a fair amount of people is, oh, he or she made this mistake. So therefore mm -hmm. we can't believe anything they ever say ever, or mm -hmm. this person did, did made this mistake. I won't, uh, they never get to, they are dehumanized, you know, mm -hmm. shoo, shoo, you have to go crawl into a cave. Um, that it's just lazy thinking, right? It's just mm -hmm. lazy thinking to shut up, shut somebody down just because they hold a different belief or I really like the way you approach it where you're just like, wow, that's interesting. What, what created that belief? You know, mm -hmm. what, uh, how, how'd you come to this conclusion? Um, it's crazy sitting here talking to you. I'm glad we're doing these podcasts now because you're, you're stirring up memories of 10, 20 years ago when we, when I first started studying some mm -hmm. of this stuff with you, um, just, and, and after, after the initial NLP training and after I got better and better and better at listening to people, you're exactly right. They started telling me all sorts of stuff mm -hmm. and I just go, you know, I just be supportive and just listen. And, mm -hmm. um, that wasn't me prior to that training. It's, I just started to really, oh, really pay attention, listen, listen for mm -hmm. those cues. And, um, it, it makes you connect with other human, human beings far easier, yeah. right? Far faster. Yeah. And so that my friend is how you tell if someone running an investment is someone you want to be running your investment. Yeah. <laughs> is right. is watching and listening and listen for the little things listen for the little things and of course there's some big things let's talk about a few red flags that anybody can see from a mile away i had someone approach me and i was back in college maybe just after college and they're like hey we got this great investment and what they do is they start talking about how nice these guys are that run this investment well guess what I, on a certain level i don't really care like if that is in your sales pitch, then that is a big red flag. They have this great mansion out in Salt Lake. It's got a basketball court. I'm like, who freaking cares? Like that's not, and I'm, and they go, all you got to do is fill out this form, give us a check. And then there's three boxes. Just check what, what return you want. You want like 8%, 13% or 15%. And I'm like, you guys are full of garbage. If you think I'm going to believe that. So that's one thing. Here's the other thing. I helped a, a, a financial advisor with this because she had she had this fella come into her office and he said, I have an $8,000 check. I want to open up uh, this kind of account, whatever the account is. And she goes, great. And he goes, I'm going to be I'm come back tomorrow with a $22 million check. And 
uh, she knew something was wrong. She didn't know what was wrong, but she knew something was wrong with this guy. And she wanted to prove it before you get through um, all the checks and uh, uh, KYC, all, all that stuff, right? Uh, and and so we went over like different things to look for. I said, look, you need to probably have, uh, you need to either be gone or you need to have a security guard come to your office because it could get ugly and you don't know what this guy is. So what's the red flag? The red flag was the check. People don't come in with a $22 million check. That is always a wire transfer, always. But what's her bias is this is a huge client that I just, but he came in off the street. $22 million doesn't come in off the street either. Right. Okay. So when you don't see the big things, like then, then all of a sudden you have to look for the, for the little things. Right. And it's just like, it's just like with, with what we're writing about in our book, I'm going to give it away. Uh, your story about the, about the cars, right. And this, in this car investment guy, and it was a, some kind of hedge fund. I don't know what it was, but, but one of your site insights looking back was, wait a minute, why is everybody here in this room? Who's going to be an investor in this? 25 years old, right? Or, or something like that. Like, like very rookie investors. Well, because they don't know any better, right? That's, yeah. that's, and that's why you were there too. Yeah. Right? And having that insight is painful and it's, and it's hurtful and it's ugly. And you know what, at a certain level, it may be the only way you're going to grow. So, um, you know, stuff, stuff, like look for the big things because the big things are usually there. The big things are usually there. And, um, you know, my, my brother always says, cause he's, a, he's a big uh, mergers and acquisitions guy. And, um, he goes, yeah, what you want to do is you want to, you want to take, uh, everything in the spreadsheet and just like cut it in half and see if it works then. Right. <laughs> and it's like, oh, okay. Well, all of a sudden you're, uh, that's a different, that's a different game, you know? And I, and I know for sure, even, even bankers, bankers that are listening, uh, a, a lot of business owners will come in and they'll just double the, income sheet just to get the loan, <laughs> you yeah. know, <laughs> just double it. Uh, so, I mean, there's in there, and there's a million, a million ways that people can take advantage of, um, of that scenario. It's just fudging the numbers. Right. And when you start to ask more questions about that, you'll start to see their veneer, uh, break down along the lines of, of what we've talked talked about, but the more you listen to them and the more you pay attention, the more you show you care about them. And the more that you think they're interesting versus, Versus being right and wrong, the more your information you're going to get, and it and it's the information that's that's under the surface, the personal information. And this circles back to I think the original question of how do you know who to trust? And it's listen to everything that they say and don't rationalize it away. And, and of course, you know, in some of my books and in my trainings, you, you can get into more specifics of of what, of how that may play out, but that's the basics of it. Yeah. It's get them talking. Mm -hmm. And I like your point of don't be right, because if they've just made a point that's clearly wrong, right. Or mm -hmm. clearly, you know, two plus two doesn't equal 20 million. Right. Um, don't interrupt them. Let them, let them keep going. Mm -hmm. Right. Just like you do. Interesting. No. Yeah. Well, I had someone, okay. I was just speaking. I was in Florida uh, Monday. I spoke in Florida to the club managers association, which is managers for these big fancy pants country clubs. Right. So uh, they have a very, very well to do clients, which I told them, you know, when it comes to lie detection, that's an advantage because people of high socioeconomic status are usually very bad liars. So little kids and uh, poor people are good liars. So I said, look, you got that going for you. Like, it's like for me personally, the person I know who's the worst liar, and I don't know why she's decided to start to lie a lot, but uh, she has two PhDs. And I'm like, that, that's, it just matches. Okay. So <laughs> um, they get uh, uh, board meetings. All, also, where was I going with that? The country club managers. Um, oh, shoot. Remind me, Law. Where were we going? Um, well, you. You were going to certain people are good liars, certain people are not, and this country club managers have an advantage because they are interacting with well to do people, people that generally right? are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I had another point; it'll come to me. But uh, but the point is that a, a lot of times, well to do people just can't. Uh, 
they're not wired to lie, right? Unless they're, they're, uh, and a lot of them are, and I shouldn't say unless, I should say the hiccup is if they're more, if they're very high on the narcissistic scale or uh, possibly going into, you know, sociopath, psychopath, and all, all of those are, um, are slang terms for uh, uh, antisocial behavior. Like that's really what it's called. It's just varying degrees of that. So um, anyway, gosh, I had a good point. Anyway, let's keep Well, going. let me, let me just run some of my techniques by you and, okay. and, and you, you jump in if you think what, you know, just jump in anytime. So a few things that I listen for when people are pitching me deals is, uh, you know, a huge red flag is if they say the G word, right? The G word is guarantee. Right. Right. Oh, yeah. No, no investment is guaranteed. Mm -hmm. You know, even even U.S. Treasuries, they call that the the risk free rate. But there's still a risk you could have. The government could fail. Right. Sure. Everything comes with risk. Um, I so that's one. If they say guarantee, they've already lost me. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, two, if they are promising stuff that is a that is beyond the standard returns for that industry. Right. Um, so if you're investing in index funds or if you're investing in real estate or if you, whatever you're investing in, somehow those returns are far beyond what normal returns are in that yeah. sector. Then I'm going, what's up with this? Right. And, and I'll, of course, ask them those questions. Um, so I'm, I'm looking for guarantees. I'm looking for outperformance. Anybody who doesn't clearly articulate the risk and what they're doing to hedge on the risk, mm -hmm. right? Here's um here's a question. I say, what's the worst case scenario? Right. right. What's the worst case scenario? Well, the worst case scenario is you lose all your money. Mm -hmm. You know, and it, 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 in a lot of these deals, and if someone's not willing to say that, um, if they're if they haven't examined the worst case scenario or the second worst case scenario, if they haven't kind of hedged and at least address these and be able to articulate them to me, then I know they're full of it or they're just totally ignorant, you know, flying by the seat of their pants. Mm -hmm. um, so those are the three big ones for me. Um, what do you think of those? Well, I like it. <laughs> I okay. like it. That's what I get. It's like, Tracy's what's common sense it. here? <laughs> yeah. What's just, what's common sense, right? There's yeah. no, I mean, like, there's certain outliers like right now, like uh, what is it? NVIDIA stock, like outlier, right? But it's sure. going to last for a little while. It's going to last for a little while. So you may catch one of those, but they're pretty far in between. I think you were talking to me about uh, cattle because I know you like to invest in farms and cattle and look at that kind of stuff. And yeah. they had some return that was just outrageous. And you're like, no. And one of your buddies did it. And of course, they lost all their money, you know, so believe, believe the common sense first. And, um, that, that's going to get you really far. Yeah. I'll give you, I'll give you one more example. It's a deal I just turned down. Um, I don't want to throw shade at them cause I, you know, but let me just, let me give you a scenario. They came in, it was a debt deal and I know, I know all about debt. I've lent a lot of money, yeah. agency debt, private debt. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. a debt guy. Um, and they had a private debt deal that was paying far, far beyond anything I've ever seen, mm -hmm. right? And I'm talking about anything I've ever seen from the big debt guys, the KKRs and the, the monster private equity firms, all the way down to the little guys like me. This, this thing was outperforming everybody uh, by many, many points. And, um, and I didn't say, you know, I, at the end I said, hey, I won't do it. But I didn't say, oh, this is ridiculous. How mm -hmm. on earth are you going to be better than these brainiacs over here, right? Yeah. But I just let them talk and I let them talk. And then at the end of the day, the pitch was, well, hey, this, these guys out of this podunk Midwest town somehow have a better way of, of lending money and can lend money in, in the high 20% range. Mm -hmm. And everybody eats it up and, and borrows that money at the high 20% range and it trickles all the way down to these investors and these investors get uh you know get you know high double digit returns on debt deals right mm -hmm. and maybe they do it maybe right uh but i don't believe it and i don't know anybody that's ever done that well mm -hmm. and uh, so they're not going to get my money and and you know that that was a huge red flag i i hope it doesn't crash and burn but either way i'm glad i didn't get into that one 
yeah. because the returns were so high. And then the believability of, you know, a small little ragtag group, nothing wrong with small, nothing wrong with home, homegrown, nothing wrong with Midwest, but somehow that those guys were far, far superior to, you know, the super big players mm-hmm. that, that lend, you know, billions of dollars a year. It's just, it was just unbelievable. So I said, no, um, mm-hmm. I wish him, wish him well, but there's a saying, you, you know, sometimes the best deal you do is the deal you don't do. Oh yeah. And for me, I'll say no, as a real estate investor, I'll say no to a hundred, 200 deals for every one I say yes to. Mm-hmm. And I think it should be that way. Now, of course, mm-hmm. this isn't legal advice. This isn't financial advice, right? <laughs> you got to talk to your attorneys. I got to put that disclaimer in there. Like, uh-huh. Don't listen to me. But, um, you know, that's, that's my two cents anyway. I think we got it covered. <laughs> I think we do, Tracy. Well, now. okay. Let me, let me close with this. Um, I love talking to you and I love listening to you. You have an amazing podcast. What's the name of your podcast? Truth, Lies, and Cover-Ups. And it's- on it, we talk to um, fraud victims, uh, crooks, uh, and law enforcement that catches them. Yeah. I mean, you interview high-end FBI, mm-hmm. CIA, yeah, um, we private have, investigators. We have, I listen uh, to that. The, the lead investigator for uh, Bernie Madoff. I got him which was, that was crazy interviewing that guy. Cause the, the, his approval FBI approval guy was sitting right there, right next to him. And he was like, okay, or n- no, like <laughs> it was crazy. And then I have the lead in, uh, or the, the FBI agent who caught the Unabomber using forensic linguistics. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Um, I have America's, uh, number one, uh, cyber criminal, uh, Brett Johnson. I have him and how he kind of invented cyber crime and would just clean out people's, uh, E-Trade accounts. And I mean, all sorts of things. Uh, and who, else? Oh, if you watch a uh, Netflix Narcos, if you watch that, I got the real DEA agents on there telling the real stories. So that wow. and a bunch of stories you've never heard. So yeah, it's pretty, fa- I learned so much. It's pretty fascinating. Well, you rub elbows with heavy hitters in the fraud and lie detection Mm -hmm. game, right? And you're up there. I mean, you're one of the top fraud detection, lie detection, body language experts on the planet. In the world. Number three, if we want to get specific. (laughs) Number three. Okay. Well, you know, number one and number two weren't available today. So (laughs) (laughs) they probably weren't. They just got their show on Dr. Phil. I'm like, Damn it. <laughs> oh, so you're one away from Dr. Phil. And here yeah. you are stuck talking to me. Oh, I know. Darn life's it. Life's rough, Tracy. What's your website? Bodylanguagetrainer.com. You can find me there. I'll speak at your event, train your people. I got uh, live classes online, uh, self-paced, you name it. I got books. I'll help you. Awesome. I've read them. I've learned a lot. I've learned a lot from you uh, for decades now. And uh, I hope you'll come on again and we'll talk more and I'll learn more. We'll do it. I love it. Awesome. Aloha, Tracy. Aloha. (laughs) See ya.